Turn to Jeremiah chapter 16 for me. Jeremiah chapter 16. We've been studying this prophet, Jeremiah. Matter of fact, speaking of, did you know that atheism is a non-profit organization? <laughs> Go ahead and turn with me, Jeremiah chapter 16. I got a question for you. If God told you to do something pretty outlandish, would you do it? Something completely countercultural, not not wrong, but different. Different what your culture expects of you and how you're supposed to live and conduct yourself. If God told you to do something outlandish, would you do it? That's going to be our subject matter as we study Jeremiah today, because God told Jeremiah to do three things that were pretty odd. If you would stand with me as we read our verses today, we're only going to read verses 1 through 9. I will reference the rest as we go through the sermon. Then, then the word of the Lord came to me. You must not marry and have sons and daughters in this place. So God is talking directly to Jeremiah, told him not to marry or have sons and daughters in this place. For this is what the Lord says about the sons and daughters born in this land and about the women who are their mothers and the men who are their fathers. They will die of deadly diseases. They will not be mourned or buried, but will be like dung laying on the ground. They will perish by the sword and famine. Their, deeds, their dead bodies will become food for the birds and wild animals. For this is what the Lord says. Do not enter a house where there is a funeral meal. Do not go to mourn or show sympathy, because I have withdrawn my blessing, my love, and my pity from these, peop these people, declares the Lord. Both high and low will die in this land. They will not be buried or mourned. No one will cut themselves or shave their head for the dead. No one will offer food to comfort those who mourn for the dead not even for a father or a mother, nor will anyone give them a drink to console them. And do not enter a house where there is feasting and sit down to eat and drink. For this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, Before your eyes and in your days I will bring an end to the sounds of joy and gladness, to the voices of, of the bride and bridegrooms in this place. Father, do thank you for your word. We pray that you would help us to learn how to apply this to our life, Lord. I pray that you would speak to me and through me, God, as your vessel, as your mouthpiece, your megaphone today, Lord. Show us your truth and help us to learn more about you, but not just for knowledge's sake, but to learn how it applies to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to examine the three prohibitions. Of, of the Lord for Jeremiah's personal life. There are three things that God told him not to partake of. Number one, God told Jeremiah not to marry. He was not to, to have a marriage, not to have a wife or family, not to have sons or daughters. He also told Jeremiah not to attend funerals, to, have, to not show mourning for people that are, that are suffering, for those that have lost loved ones. And he also told Jeremiah, lastly, not to attend any joyful feasts like a wedding banquet or a celebration. Very strange things the Lord asked and told Jeremiah to do. Not to marry, go to funerals, or to weddings. A strange thing. Some of y'all be like, I'll be, I'll be glad never to go to a funeral again or to a wedding again. But... These are very odd things for God to ask Jeremiah, especially when you consider the culture of the Jewish people of the time. Why would God tell Jeremiah to do these things? I think it was primarily it was a living display of prophecy. Jeremiah was a walking billboard for God's condemnation for the people of Judah. He did more than just speak words of prophecy. He lived it. You see that? He didn't just speak prophecy against Judah. He lived it by his life. He was able to tell them and show them what God's message was. And we'll get into that as we go. When we commit to following the Lord, listen here, nothing is off limits. You hear that? When you commit to following the Lord, 
You signed the deed over to the Lord of your life. It's His. It is Christ who rose. It is Christ who lives in you. Christ who lives through you. When we followed Christ and we committed to follow Him, He owns us. Sometimes we think we still are in control. We, st we try to take the reins and we'll, we'll reach conviction about that from time to time in our life. But the Lord is the owner. He's the director. He's the orchestrator here. He has the right and the only one who has the right to govern our lives. And nothing is off limits. Many professing Christians seem to miss this part of the gospel message. When we we surrendered our life to the Lord. We surrendered all of our rights to Him as well. Sometimes in our many churches today, they forget to talk about the surrender part of salvation. It is really raising your white flag saying, Lord, I've done a crummy job leading my own life, and it's only led to my own destruction, and so I will submit to you. I surrender to you as my Lord and my Savior. You can't call Jesus Lord unless you're going to call yourself a slave of that Lord. Many Christians forget that when Jesus was asked, well, how do we become a disciple of you? Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. That's some hard, hard words to accept. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So that means that we can't just live our lives like we want to and indulge in some sin and put some money in the offering plate to relieve any guilt that we may have and go about our days working, watching football and cooking shows and thinking everything's all good to go. Well, that might be the American dream, but it's not the Christian way. Amen? Now, the Christian life is characterized constantly in the New Testament Characterized by death. Christ's death, but ours as well. We are to die to ourselves. For us to truly live in Christ, we must die to our selfish ways. So, how does Jeremiah's lifestyle speak to us today? I want you to ask yourself this question. What are you willing to surrender to the Lord? What are we willing to surrender to the Lord? Number one here. Are we willing to surrender our reputation? Because in Jewish custom, I learned this this week, this was interesting to me, men in the Jewish custom were likely married before the age of 20. And in fact, the Jewish Talmud would curse, pronounced a cursing on the men if they were not married by the age of 20. Now that's not a biblical concept, that was a custom a Jewish custom, cultural thing. Now, to be married and to have children, additionally, was a sign of blessing for the Jewish people. If you were married, you had children, that was a sign of God's blessing you. As a matter of fact, it was a way to maintain the integrity of the Jewish nation. Like, if everybody was single and didn't get married, then the nation could not grow, right? All right, so the nation was kind of hinged upon people marrying one another, hinged upon babies being made so that the, the community can grow and they can be well established in that land to grow as God's people. So to be married and to have children was a blessing from God. And likewise, a lot of people in the culture thought that if you could not have children or that you did not marry, you were considered cursed. Cursed by God. Strange concept. Not a biblical one, but a strange one. One that was accepted by the, the, the people of Jeremiah's day. So for Jeremiah not to marry, that would mean he would risk being ridiculed and assumed that he was cursed. You see that? He was having to risk his reputation to follow the Lord's command. When was the last time that your reputation was at risk for following the Lord's command? When we follow Christ, we may not be well liked because Christ is a controversial subject in this world. You know, people will gladly, a lot of times, talk about God. Okay, God is not real offensive to most people in this world. 
But if you bring up specifically Jesus, well, then things change. Well, you can't say Jesus is the only way. There's lots of ways to God. You hear that? Well, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus made it a very narrow way. Are you willing to surrender your reputation to follow Christ? How do people know you? When people think of you, what do they think of? Do you, when people think of you, what do they associate you with? Do they associate you with your, maybe your baldness? <laughs> maybe it's your hairstyle. Maybe it's a talent or a skill that you have. Maybe it's your singing abilities. Maybe it's your lack of preaching abilities. <laughs> What, does, what do people know you as? I hope, and my prayer is that when people think of me, they see Jesus first. I don't know that they do all the time, but that's my fault. But what about people think of you? Do they see Jesus in you? Is there enough evidence in your life that would lead them to Christ without you having to say a word? Do people see you or see Jesus in you? about your friends and your family, your co-workers, the people you look up to? Do they see Jesus in you? You know, even church people can ridicule believers who are sold out and following the Lord. I've experienced this. People that are churchgoers, that call themselves a Christian, they, they stifle the faith of other believers who are trying to do what God has asked them to do. And then these church people are pretty much staunching the faith of this believer when, in their faith. I don't know why this happens all the time. I don't know why this happens at any of the time. But it may be because this, this, this people or this person is feeling convicted about sin in their life. And when they see someone else who's sold out, they don't want to address their sin. So they try to stop their faith. You see that? They don't want to be convicted about the sins in their life. Sometimes it could be a theological misunderstanding of what God has asked. Sometimes it's, it's something else. One of my favorites is when brothers and sisters in Christ think they have a better plan for your life than the Lord does. <laughs> oh, you don't need to do that. Oh, no, you, don't, you need to do this over here. Oh, you're called to preach. Oh, you're called to do this. They don't tell me. What I'm called to do. That's between me and the Lord. Now, some contingencies here. Before I get to that, though, I want to mention this. Sometimes people, honestly, just need to be avoided when they are talking like that, especially if they have unconfessed sin in their life, and you know that. Well, these people need to address that sin before they start addressing yours. Lord needs to convict their heart. In Galatians 5, verses 7 and 8, Say this, Paul says this, You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. You see the image there? He says, you are running your waist race well. You think of a, like people who are at a running track, and they have the lanes on the track. They're running in their lane, and they're running well. And the image here is that somebody stepped in their way and preventing them from going forward. They have to divert their path to go around them, or divert their path to go some other direction. And Paul was saying, who got in your way from obeying the truth? In other words, you let them get in the way. Because you let them influence you in a negative way. You let them deny or prevent you from obeying what you knew to be true, and you were diverted. Who stepped in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Now, this is not to say that everyone who disagrees with you is trying to get in your way and to keep you from obeying the truth. It is a good, wise action of us to go and seek wise counsel, right? It's good to have wise counsel. People you trust, you can confide in, that will give you wise counsel. However, not all counsel is wise. The counsel that we seek from other people needs to be sifted by the Word of God and your personal relationship with Him, right? That's how we know the truth. 
We don't accept someone else's word for it. It is our personal relationship with the Lord that we have to address. Are you willing to surrender your reputation to the Lord? Would you pray with me this prayer? Let's pray together. Father, do thank you for changing us. God, I pray that you would help us to be bold and be willing to be different in this world. That we'll be willing to be shamed and to be looked at as weird or strange. Because God, our reputation ultimately does not matter in this world. God, we put our attention on you. We care about you and what you think of us. So God, if you want to change our, our reputation in this world, Father, so be it. But I pray that it changes so that people see Jesus in us. In Jesus' name, amen. The second thing, are you willing to surrender your plans? Are we willing to surrender our plans to the Lord? Now, do you think when Jeremiah was growing up and he was looking toward his future and thinking about all the things he wanted to do, do you think he had this thought? You know, you know what I want to do when I grow up? I want to be single, live alone, never go to a funeral, never go to a, a wedding or any kind of birthday party or anything like that. Matter of fact, I'm going to live every day of my life trying to tick off everybody that I meet. <laughs> That's essentially what he did because of the message that he was bringing from the Lord. I doubt he had that kind of mentality as he was thinking about his life. But this is the path that he chose because he felt this is what the Lord was calling him to do. And Jeremiah was, in fact, called for a very special purpose. But the cost to his obedience was rather high. He had to surrender a lot of his plans to serve the Lord. And many of us make plans to follow the Lord, amen? We make plans without even considering the Lord sometimes. I've been guilty of that. But making plans are not bad. But we need to be sure that we are planning with the Lord's priorities in mind. How can we use our plans to fulfill our purpose? And what's our purpose? As believers in Christ, we have one general purpose, to glorify God. And part in doing that is making disciples. Making disciples of Christ. So, There are some elements of consideration for the believer in Christ when we're making plans for the Lord or making plans in general. Are we giving God authority in our life to change our plans? Does He have the ability to change the plans that you made? Or are they so set in stone that it doesn't matter who or what gets in your way? You're going to fulfill your plans in life. I've had to swallow some pride, pride pills when I've had that mentality. Matter of fact, when I was called to preach, I was not on board with being a pastor. <laughs> I, was, I was surrendered to the ministry to do what God wanted me to do, but I was like, God, God I'll do anything you want me to accept. <laughs> right? <laughs> except being a pastor. <laughs> and the Lord's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I was pretty reluctant to be a pastor. I, would, I was not... I didn't think I had the personality for it, didn't think I had the demeanor for it, and uh, certainly wasn't mentally prepared for it, but the Lord had to do the work in my life. The Lord had to slowly adapt me and change me to, to accept the position and to be spiritually prepared for it. I can't say that I'm really good at it now, but here I am, <laughs> and the Lord's continuing to work on me, continuing to use me, even in spite of my my frailties, and in spite of my sin and my difficulties. Are you willing for God to change your plans and your future? My friends, do you even care about God's plan for your life? Do you care that God has an interest in you? Do you care that God has a specific thing He wants you to do? Have you considered Him? Have you asked Him to show you? I think that's a good first step. Lord, what are your plans for me? And when we ask the Lord for that, we can't ask with a closed hand. <laughs> Lord, I'll do anything you want except. 
No, it is that, Lord, I'll do anything you want. Because ultimately, I am, not the, I am not the master here. You are my Lord. I serve you. We come with open hands and open, open hearts and a willingness to do whatever we, ever he wants. Would you pray that prayer with me? Lord, I ask that you to help us to surrender our plans to you. Because, God, we are giving you the authority in our life to be open, to be honest, and leave you room to work and to change what we have planned, God. Our plans are tentative at best. We may have a general, general direction, God, but you have the authority in our life to change us and to change our ways. But you show us what our next step is as we are obedient to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Number three. Are we willing to surrender our comfort? This one's tough, to be honest with you. Surrendering our comfort. You know, in our American dream that we're living in, we like comfort. We have built a society on comfortability, right? We don't like to be uncomfortable. We get mad when it's 74 degrees in the house, and it should be 72, right? Or right now, it's, you know, 68 instead of 69, right? <laughs> We are creatures of comfortability. But we mentioned that God called Jeremiah into celibacy. But think about the implications of what this means. Jeremiah had to face some inner turmoil with this. Some inner turmoil. The inner turmoil of being alone. He was, he was alone and he was threatened with, with discouragement of not having someone there by his side to encourage him during dark times. And he certainly had his share of dark times. No one was there to comfort him. No one was there to, to encourage him. He didn't have a wife to, to support him. He didn't have a family that would look after him in his old age. He didn't have children to take care of and build a family for himself. He, he trusted God would take care of all that, and God certainly did. But he had this inner turmoil that he faced, waking up every day to an empty home. No sounds, no nothing. And it was a constant reminder to Jeremiah of the devastation that was going to come. The devastation that was going to come on Judah. All of this was a prophecy that Babylon was going to come and take over the city of Jerusalem and everything would be changed. There would be no normalcy anymore. God told him not to marry or go to a wedding feast because it was a display to the people that a day was coming that no one would be given to marriage. No one would be born in this land and everyone would die or many people would die of diseases and sword and famine. He was a walking testimony and a walking prophecy of his daily, in his daily life. But Jeremiah's commitment to celibacy was also a testimony for how serious he took God's words. And how seriously he took his commitment to following him. He demonstrated it because actions often speak louder than words. You've probably heard that a time or two. But Jeremiah not only faced inner turmoil, he faced outer turmoil. We get several different passages in throughout Jeremiah where he was tortured, he was imprisoned, he was beaten, and he was experiencing all kinds of uncomfortability, if you will. Spending night, a day, uh, se several nights, I don't know how long he was in there, in a pit, a miry, muddy pit, left there to die. That is not the most comfortable place. I don't know if anybody's ever been in one. But not in the most comfortable place. But he was willing to be abused and imprisoned and go through all this heartache because he was following the Lord's commands. There's no greater comfort than in the middle of the Lord's will. You hear that? There's no greater comfort than being smack dab in the middle of God's will for your life. Because He is the one that ultimately supplies our comfort. Amen. He is the one that gives us the peace when the whole world seems to be at war. We can have the peace of God in our life. And it's only found through Christ. If 
Father, do thank you for the comfort that you bring to us. We thank you for the cross and the Holy Spirit who comes into our life, Father, when we receive you. And I pray that you would give us that comfort and peace. But Father, we are not promised easy days. We're not promised to be comfortable, God. We are called to be different in this world, and this world will hate us. But Father, we, we lean on your promises, knowing that you give us everything that we need. And we trust in you, in Jesus' name. Amen. And number four, are we willing to surrender our social life? God told Jeremiah not to participate in funerals. This was an odd one. But attending a funeral, not attending a funeral, was a sign that God had withdrawn his sympathy. He withdrawn his pity over Judah. In the destruction that was to come, there would be no more burials. No one would have a proper burial. And for, for the Jewish people, to not to have a proper burial was extremely disgraceful. And they thought that it was even a curse not to be buried properly. And God was confirming to them, yeah, everyone here will not have a proper burial when Babylon comes. People will be lying in the streets, stacked high, down in the pits, filled to the brim. Because the Lord has abandoned this place. And the command not to eat feast was a reminder that there will come a day where there will be no more joy and no more gladness in this place. Jeremiah was a walking testimony. And whenever someone asked Jeremiah why he didn't partake in these social things, why, did, why, did, why wasn't he married, why didn't he go to funerals or to, to celebrations, it was an opportunity for Jeremiah to share this message of Christ. You know, when you're different, and you look different from this world, you're countercultural, people may ask questions of you. And it's our duty to use that as an opportunity to share what Christ has done. Amen? Like, why don't you do this? Why don't you watch this show or this movie? Why don't you listen to that kind of music? Why do you go to church instead of stay home on Sundays? Why do you pray before a meal? Why do you treat people nicely when they're rude and mean to you? Why are you honest with your taxes? Why do you give money even when you don't have any money? Why are you rarely anxious or worried? Why are you happy and smiley all the time? These are opportunities we have that if people ask us, they see it, we should have a reasonable defense to show them why we have hope in Christ. Amen? We have hope because of the gospel. And when Jeremiah was asked, or he could have been asked, why, why are you doing these things, Jeremiah? This is what Jeremiah said in verse 11, or God told Jeremiah to say in verse 11. It says, it is because your ancestors forsook me, declares the Lord, and followed other gods and served and worshipped them. They forsook me and did not keep my law, but you have behaved more wickedly than your ancestors. That's why Babylon is coming. That's why the Lord has abandoned this place. You have acted more wickedly than your ancestors. You know, even in all this disaster that was coming upon Judah, God gave them a promise, a message of hope in verse 15. Don't miss this. Because even in light of all the disaster of this world that we are going through, there is still a message of hope for us. He said for this in verse 15, As surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites out of the land of the north, talking about Babylon, and out of the countries where, where he had banished them, for I will restore them to the land I gave their ancestors. In other words, even though Babylon's coming, even though I've forsaken this place, God says, even though everything will be banished and, and life will be totally uprooted as you know it, you will return here. I will restore you here because I am faithful. And I will, with, I will hold for me a remnant who is faithful to me. And that's what he did. Seventy years after banishment, he brought them back to the land. And he punished Babylon. And the message of hope that we have is we have an eternal home that we're waiting on. Amen. A home that he is already preparing for us now. 
And we're waiting for that coming, that final trumpet sound where we are rescued and brought to Him and we can be with Him forever and all eternity. And that's a great day I'm looking forward to and I hope you are. But this is also a reminder to us for endurance. Because this world may not be easy as we wait. But Romans 8, 18 that Jesse read earlier, I want to reemphasize this. It says, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That should give you chills right there. Our present sufferings do not even compare to the glory that's coming. When we get to heaven, when we see the glory of all things, and God makes everything new, we're going to forget about this life. And that's what we set our eyes on. When we set our eyes on the finish line, it's easier to endure where you are on the track. Right? Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this message. And God, I pray that you'd help us to live surrendered lives that are about your business, Father. I pray that you would help us to be so open before you, God, that you, we are just vessels in your hand to be used by you in whatever capacity you shape, you mold us for every, any tool you want us to be used as. Any weapon of righteousness, as your scripture speaks of, God, use us as your instruments. And I pray that we would hold nothing back. But God, I thank you for your patience with us. Because, Lord, we often get in our own way. We often stumble ourselves up. And we let people get in our way and deter us from obeying the truth. And I pray that, Lord, you would convict us of that. You show us where we are getting off track. Show us where we're slowing down in our faith, Father. And I pray that you would reignite that flame in our hearts to be so sold out for you. And God, I pray that anyone here or anyone watching this video later, if they have not received you as their personal Lord, God, that you would convict their hearts to help them submit to you, God. There's no greater place to be than on our knees at the cross. You do your work in us, in Jesus' name. Amen.